I'm Davey Hamilton, and this is The Skinny. I'm Kevin Olson, and this is The Skinny. From Fathead Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Hey guys, we got a great show coming your way from the skinny here. A little snow blowing outside, but it's nice and warm in here. Some great stories are about to happen, courtesy of two icons in the sport. Coming in remotely will be KO, Kevin Olson. He's been doing this for a long, long time. He's up in Wisconsin. And then sitting alongside, joining us in the studio here is Davey Hamilton. Finished second in the points three times in his career, 56 starts in IndyCar. And uh, certainly a guy that has found the winner's circle a number of times, super modified, stadium trucks. I mean, you've been racing for forever and ever and ever. Thanks for joining us here, Davey. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great stuff. And then, of course, uh, coming to us from Wisconsin is Kevin Olson. And this guy, 69 years old and just won a race less than a year ago. Pretty amazing, my friend, that you're still out there getting it done. In fact, we should go the, the BMRA midget points. He finished fourth in the points in 2017, I think it was. Fifth in the points 2018, or maybe it was fifth last year. Nonetheless, I mean, still out there getting it done, my friend, and clearly doing it your own way. <laughs> well, we're trying. I'm going to run again this year, uh, you know, unless I have the big heart attack and uh, don't make it to that. But, uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, we're still having a lot of fun doing this and got lucky last year and won a one, one up at sun Prairie and, uh, we're going to keep going and keep, you know, until they won't let us run no more. And for our fans that aren't familiar with KO, let's get you up to speed. We don't just let anybody here on the skinny. You've got to earn your way on here. You got to come in with a few accolades or at least be very funny. Like Robin Miller. Uh, this guy is both Kevin is, is funny, but more importantly, 27 USAC midget wins, a two-time USAC National Midget Champion, 1982 and 1987, five-time Badger Midget Association Champion, won the Turkey Night Grand Prix in 83, also won the Hut 100. So you've certainly earned your way onto our show, that's for sure. And then, of course, a number of funny stories along the way. But let's go back to what you were talking about, that, that motorcycle crash where you broke some, some ribs, your scapula, and at the time, you were actually leading in the points for the Badger, uh, the Badger Association uh, in the midget division. Uh, actually, I punctured a lung, too. But uh, uh, w what happened was is we were leading the points, and I knew that we had to, uh, you know, just having a couple setbacks like that, you'd be kind of a, a sophie if you didn't run uh, with them, like, like the Foyt and Parnelli and all the guys used to do. So I ran eight days later, but... Uh, it was a little bit. Uh, it was a little bit rougher. I will admit that, you know. But uh, oh, hey, by the way, too, when we were talking about accomplishments, uh, uh, you forgot in 1986, I, I won the uh, longest tow award from Daytona uh, when we ran down in Florida, <laughs> and uh, that was really the big one for me. Can, can you hang on for just a second? This is really important. Just for one second. Yeah, yeah, Roger. Roger, I'm. Uh, I'm talking with Davey and Carl right now. Listen. I'll get you back a little later. Uh, uh, go ahead with the plans in the first turn anyway. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Uh, Is that Penske, Penske calling sorry. in? <laughs> yeah, Roger, that was him on the phone right now. Uh, well, we got a deal going. I probably shouldn't say anything yet, but... Uh, what he wants me to do is, is he wants to bring a weekly show there with the, uh, the bombers and the figure eight down in the first turn. And, uh, we're going to utilize what they have there already. And then, uh, also he's pretty big on doing the monster trucks, trucks and the swamp buggies in the infield. But, you know, I keep telling him I'm, I'll get to it when I can get to it. So I don't know, you know, he actually said that with the monster trucks, he might want to try to run with them one himself, you know, he was the 1962, I believe, Sports Illustrated Driver of the Year. So he can still run. So anyway, sorry about the phone call. But what were we talking about again? <laughs> so, 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 K.O., this is Davey. So, so remind him the time. You're on the radio broadcast with us at IMS Radio. So he was a pit reporter for us at IMS Radio now for several years. And he goes up to Roger after Roger gets his 16th or 17th poll. Kevin, to tell the story better. But he asked him, he goes, Roger, I know this is your, you know, 17th pole for the Indy 500. You won 17 races. But, but tell us honestly, will, will your career ever really be complete without a Swamp Buggy <laughs> Championship? 
<laughs> Whenever I show up, it's just pure chaos. It seems like I don't quite get it, but uh, I've been. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you guys got a hold. I was sick there this last week, and uh, I, I believe it or not, I had just got back from China too, which wasn't probably good. I, I ate. I I kind of ate some undercooked. I think there were dogs, dogs or cats or something over there. And, a a oh, scaly animal. Week. Yeah, when Davey called yesterday, I was hoping I could do this and still, you know, still have a, 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 my mind clear and everything. But, uh, you know, I think that's what well, it was. Well, see, that didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, no. he has, he's, he's had few, uh, flu-like symptoms, but other than that, he's been great since coming back. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I just just got back from there, too. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I didn't need to interrupt. <laughs> David, let's talk about what's coming up, man. You're uh, you're back on the radio for IndyCar. Yeah, it's gonna be cool. Back on the radio for uh, for IndyCar. I'm still doing the two seater program. I've been doing that since the inception, 2001. Um, things have changed with Roger, right? So we who knows how it's all gonna lay out. But we're excited, and um, you know, still with Harding Harding Stipe, It's actually Andretti Harding Steibrenner Racing now with Colton Hurtis. So see what that that group Are you of still guys. Involved with the yeah, team still, there as well, huh? It's just helping take care of sponsorship for the guys and. Um, obviously Michael has a crew over there, right? He doesn't need really anybody to help, but, um, but Colton's a good kid. I want to help all I can. Brian Herter, you know, we, we go a long ways back and, um, so it's gonna be cool, you know? And, and like I said, I, I missed radio been a couple years since I've done it. So, uh, we're back, we're back at it. You've been in the sport a long time and you were heavily involved with that team a year ago. Talk about that Colton Herter kid, man. What a talent. He, he has it right. And it's so easy for him. I never seen a kid then get in a car, right? And go so fast, so easy. And now, as a so-called night, like Brian's a driver coach as well, right? For his own son. So that was kind of Brian's with, with uh, Andretti, with Marco. So uh, I thought, you know, I'll help him out with, uh, with whatever he needs as a driver, you know, coach, so to speak. Well, that kid, he's fast, man. He unloads and he's fast. You don't have to, like, how, how do you tell him anything when he's P1? He's a rookie, in the, rookie and goes out and qualifies on the pole at, twice? Did he do it twice? No, we year? had three poles, two wins. So three poles, two wins. So what I did learn with, with him, though, is race etiquette. You know what I mean? He, he Like in Long Beach, for example, we had a bad pit stop. So he's a young kid, man. He's, he, he wants to go. And so he was gaining one second lap on Bourdais, the car in front of us, which was like 15 seconds in front. I'm going, one, one second lap on Bourdais? It's pretty impressive. But then he hit the wall, right? So that was where... Just some patience, some race etiquette was is what he needed, and but but then he goes on, he wins like I say, two races, three poles, and and without a few mistakes at Pocono, um, the Indy 500 was the heartbreaker where we qualified sixth, I think it was, some you know, good, very, right. yeah, very good, and we go out and we had a, a pinhole leak, literally a pinhole leak in the fuel bladder, and as the car sat on the on the grid for a couple hours during you know pre-race ceremonies. The fuel came out, went in the side pod. He goes in the corner. The fuel goes out, hits the header, catches on fire, and it burns a little p hole in our shifter link, or sh shifter line, the air shifter line, and he couldn't shift. I mean, it puts us out of the biggest race, and, you know, he had a shot of winning it. And Pocono, he had a little mistake, and, and Long Beach in there. So you take a few of those out, and he's a, he's a contender for the championship. So with, with teammates now, he had no teammates. He did and didn't because we were part of the Andretti group. But really now, he has, you know, Rossi and Hunter Ray and those guys, that Marco and – Veach, they're all going to be a good team, man. So it's going to be cool. Ko, we're just a couple of weeks from the first uh, from the first Indy start of the 2020 season. You keep an eye on that stuff. You keep an eye on these on the current racers. Oh, uh, sure. You know the the kid that really impressed me was Antonio. Is a Ferrucci? Is that how you call it? Ferrucci. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 You know he he came down and ran the Chili Bowl with us this year, and I tell you what, I was really impressed with the kid. I mean he. He really seems like someone that, that, first of all, has got a ton of talent. I mean, and he come down to the chili bowl knowing nothing about running dirt or anything else. And uh, I kind of tried to help him a little bit, whatever I know about him. He, he learned very quick, you know. I mean, it, 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 he didn't mind looking bad in front of the people, you know, what they were going to say or that. Because, you know, it's a whole different ballgame. I was really impressed with, with this kid's you know, eagerness to try to race dirt. You know, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, uh, after watching him at the 500 last year and a few other races, man, this guy looks fearless. But uh, I, I think I think he's going to be somebody in the future that we're all going to, you know, be uh, seeing win a lot of races, and along with a lot of other young kids. But, uh, man, he really stood out to me to be able to come down and, and throw his hat in the ring at the Chili Bowl. 
Yeah, so, talented guy. I mean, he's uh, one of the. He, he, I mean, stature-wise, perfect for a midget, smaller dude, yeah. and uh, and very talented. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he completed more laps than anybody else in the series last year. IndyCar, I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, and you, you just watched the 500, some of the moves that he made in that race, going through some accidents, as K.O. said, man, he's fearless. Did you tell him, K.O., at the Chili Bowl, the problem was he didn't have an open-face helmet, probably? Like, well, like you, that, you know, he's... he's handkerchief. He's young yeah, yet, you know, and he'll, he'll learn, and uh, T-shirt, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the kids nowadays don't don't really uh, understand the advantage of doing that. I mean, it's lighter. You can see more out the side and everything. And uh, I, that's all I ever wear at the Chili Bowl. Although I got to admit this year, I had a car flip uh, next to me in, in the qualifying race. And it come down and hit my cage, I guess. It hit something anyway. And uh, it uh, broke my helmet. I had a, a, a I think it, what it did is it hit my head, hit against those stupid seats they have nowadays that hold you upright instead of you know and you know what i mean they, they these guys getting these cars and and the cars doing all the work you got you got a seat that holds you up so you never get tired you know in the old days hell your head would be hanging out the side but you just kept going you know you, <laughs> nowadays it's, it's it's too easy you know and uh you know power steering and all that so i'm uh I, i'm a proponent of, of of getting rid of the Getting rid of the, the the cages, getting you know, getting a car that you got to drive instead of the car. And I'm talking about in all divisions, stock cars, indie cars, everything. You know, <laughs> get rid of all the downforce. Get it where the drivers got to drive it. And uh, at the end of the race, if your uniform isn't all full of oil and you're totally exhausted <laughs> and have to be helped out of the car, I don't think the car's doing. You know, I think the car's working too good because that's what. Otherwise, anybody can do it. You know, you can get 100-pound kids, women, me, you know, uh, you get them, anybody can do it, you know. So you need, you need it where, where the cars aren't doing so much. And uh, I'm a big proponent of this and uh, toughen these guys up a little bit, you know. You got to get hurt once in a while. No, yeah, no, 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 that's, da aluminum. that's dangerous. No, 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 you got to oh. – Open face is, is the only way to go, you know, and you got to lose a tooth now and then, too. You know, when you, when <laughs> rock you, smoke you, and you're right. Get hit mouth. rocks, dirt. And Monday morning, I used to get up, and, you know, your arm would get totally plastered with rocks. and Your arm would, would be purple, green, blue. Davies probably knows a little about that. We didn't have all them wimpy side panels on, on the things to, you know, that you do nothing. Just put decals on, so. You know, if Roger puts me in charge, we're going to see a lot of changes in this direction. And I think the fans will like it a lot better. You got to be able to see the guy in the car driving. You got to be able to see him working the wheel. All that's gone now. You know, you just see the top of some guy's head. So uh, I guess I, I shouldn't be uh, getting out of soapbox, but uh, that's that's kind of the way it should be. You know, you know, another thing that back in the day, you know, AJ would drive the dirt mile in the silver crown car, then you run a sprint car somewhere, then you get in his Indy car. And, and, um, we're fortunate Kay and I to be able to where you can race four or five times a week, you know, and that's how, we, and even Tony, you know, even though he's a little younger than us, but we're able to race a lot of different things and be, had to be very versatile to drive everything at any time. And, uh, today, unfortunately, a lot of our drivers, um, they just drive Indy car. That's it. And I always, I always think that the Indy lights program struggling a little bit as you know, I mean, all you gotta do is watch a race and see the car counts down. But if come of those, you know, a Castro Nevis or a Dario or or a Will Power or a Simon Pagano came and ran an Indy Lights, or would that help get those? Because now these kids and that have to beat those guys. It's so different than Kyle running his truck, right? Right. And we see the bet that's going on, yeah. and if anybody can beat Kyle, I, as a young kid, I wanted to beat the best. So bring the best on, right? And, right. and so, um, and and to me. You know, I th I remember one year I, I, w I was lining up. I think I had 67 races to do that year. Then Stewart had like 80 some. I go that bastard. He, you know, I mean, he always has a few more, right? <laughs> right? But but you know, running 17 races a year wouldn't cut it for me as a racing driver. It just would not cut it. I I, right. I, I go crazy when you know I wanted to race every weekend as much as I could. I know KO is the same. It didn't matter if we had to drive all night to the next race or what it took, and and uh, we just made it happen. And you don't see that that much anymore. The problem is it's it, it is ex exactly what you're talking about with the Indy Lights thing. You know, with Roger coming in, and and I'm I'm excited to see what's going to happen because something has to happen. We got to get a road back to Indy, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. And we got to, you know, it's it's where you guys were, Ko, and you know Tony and everything, and came up through midget sprint cars, Silver Crown, 
you know, and then you get to, uh, you know, an Indy Lights because now you're in a rear engine car. You know the feeling of that. And then you, you know, go from Indy Lights to an Indy car. Who's the most deserving in my mind today? Cody, uh, Cody Swanson. Yeah. I mean, he has every right to be there, but it's, it's not there. And it, you know, it can be driven off of sponsorship again, like it used to be instead of being driven off of, Hey, I'm going to bring some money to this deal. Yeah. Well, Tony would be the first to tell you that there was a few of us, a handful of us, 10, maybe that had the opportunity when Tony George started the program that we were lucky to be one of the ones that made it through there. KO, he made it to that point, too. I mean, there's no reason that he couldn't be in an Indy car when he was at his prime, but the door wasn't open for him. There was no opportunity for him to come in there. Now, his best friend, though, it did work, right? Stan Fox, which was my teammate as a rookie, um, he was able to make it in. The right things happened, and he proved that he could get the job done. Um, so, And that's you know Billy Vukovic, who was my best buddy, who unfortunately got killed, kind of introduced me to a lot of people in the, in the Vukovic family. So we have a little bit in common in there, too, have, having our best friends, you know, get hurt and, and lose yeah. their lives. And that. so that's, that's yeah. not the fun part of the sport. But, but it's hard to make it there. It is hard to make it there, for sure. Right. Guys like uh, Jack Hewitt and Kenny Schrader, it, it, my best year, I think I ran 104 races, but we averaged usually 70 or 80, you know, just ran wherever you could. But these guys and Schrader still out there doing it. I mean, year after year after year, these guys run, you know, well, Jack, Jack would run probably well over 100 every year, but it was nothing for them. We were in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland, running a, a Silver Crown race out there, and we rained out on Friday. And uh, Jack jumped in the truck, and they headed back to uh, – uh, down there by uh, in southern Indiana to a, a sprint car race, turned right around, came back to Hagerstown where we ran Sunday afternoon. But that was just normal for them, you know, or, or Kenny's the same way. You know, I mean, one night he'll be in this state, the next, and, and he's only home, you know, not much throughout the year. But, I mean, that was just normal because the more you raced, the more you honed your skills, the better you were, you know, I mean, by May, when I would start racing, I'd already have 30-some races in. We'd start at Sun Prairie or something, and, and, and I'd have an edge on these guys, you know. And uh, you just don't seem to, you know, nowadays in NASCAR, they talk about the grueling schedule, you know, and they, and they, they sit in the air-conditioned uh, holler or whatever half the time during the day and, you know, drink there the rest of the time till it's time to race, you know? So, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just get a kick out of that because the old days, you know, it, it was just commonplace. Did, did you get to see Stewart's, uh, speech at the hall of fame? <laughs> yeah, I watched it on TV. It was pretty damn good. I, I wrote him because we had done a deal together, uh, last December, I guess over in Ohio. And uh, I wore my Elvis uh, costume there, you know, the Elvis. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I guess you'd call it. And anyway, Tony's got one, too, I guess. So, I, you know, I wrote him right away and I asked him why he didn't wear his Elvis outfit. I think that would have been the perfect time to do it, you know. I mean, <laughs> the king, accepting baby. that yeah. award with, with NASCAR, wouldn't that be cool, though? I mean, you know, and it's something I think Tony would probably do, you know. But, uh, well, yeah, that whole, was an excellent. He, he, he's, he's a good speaker. He really is. Dude, the whole thing with the girlfriends. Oh, that was classic. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all the girlfriends who were there as part of this journey with me. These girlfriends' short time and sacrifice meant a lot to me. He's got a deal with Tiffany's there for uh, engagement rings where, like, he's got a punch card. Like, every 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 tenth one is free, you know? <laughs> And, 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 you know, he'll get an engagement ring and then, you know, they punch it. And when they get to 10, he gets a free one. So, I mean, he's got it going there. I know that. <laughs> hey, Davey, let's get serious for a second. Right. Because I don't know how many people understand everything that you went through in your career. Let's go to 2001, a place called Texas Motor Speedway. Well, let's take a Oh, contact was made between Schrader and uh, Sarah Fisher back there. She just kind of ran over some stuff. But Schrader and Hamilton... When they got together, let's see what happens as they... Oh, oh Schrader. Uh, engine blues blue. engine. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Everybody was a victim of circumstances right there. It wasn't anybody's fault. When that engine let go, Schrader couldn't do anything. Mm. Hamilton tried to go to the outside to miss him, but got caught up and into the fence. Boy, he took a ride. Larry. Yes, he did. And mm. you can see uh, 
That oil was just everywhere. Hamilton just barely clipped him, but boy, he backed into the fence very hard. Almost oh, gets upside man. down. He hit that wall a ton, and Sarah Fisher just got into the debris. Many doctors thought the best option was to amputate your legs, and instead you go through, you decide to fight, you go through 23 operations, and come 2007, you get back inside of a race car and finish ninth at the 500. Yeah, eh, crazy times. That's what we do. I didn't want a real job. I knew that. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I had to figure out how not to have a real job. Um, took a long time, though. You know, I, I was damaged goods. So as to an owner, when you, when you hire a driver, that's a big commitment, right? It takes a lot of money. It, it, uh, you know, I was fortunate not to have to buy a ride. You know, I was very fortunate through my career. I was always hired. But, um, you know, when you're damaged goods, and, and in my mind, I didn't know if I could still do it. You know, you have fused ankles and some limitations, and when you're out of the car a long time, you just don't know. So they got Hewlett Packard. I, I ran into the CEO of Hewlett Packard, and he believed in my story and myself, so I uh, uh, gave it a shot, man. And, and uh, I remember, you know, it, those, are, those first two years were the bitch, man. Let me tell you, wheelchairs, learn how to walk again. I remember seeing you at IRP yeah. on the grid yeah. in a chair where you were, I mean, your yeah. legs were up. External and, yeah. fixators. It was ugly. You know, I, I tried to stay out as much as you could, but it's humiliating. You know, as a guy that you, you go do, I was, I did everything. You know, I mean, I just went, if you were going to do something, but now I'm relying on people that take me play. My B Bones, Johnny, Flash, Jeff Troyer, all these guys that babysat me, basically, and it's not that much fun when you have to be taken care of like that. So it wasn't, and Tony, to be honest with you, Tony and, and, and um, you know, his his mom and a lot of people came to help out a lot, and, and uh, Eddie, you know, came up, and yeah. there, there was a lot of support, but it's still tough. And uh, and so, fortunately, I kept my legs. I do, I do have limitations of what I could, can and can't do, but I still snow ski, do a lot of things, but my goal was to get back in a race car, and that was part of my... Uh, my healing process, to be honest with you, because in my mind, I was going to tell anybody, hey, can't wait to get back in a race car, because then they know you're crazy, for sure. They, they said, did <laughs> right. you get a head injury, too? You know, because you, you right. want to do it again. But um, I just kept it to myself, and just knowing that I'm going to get back in one way or another. And uh, it took a long time, but then, uh, like I say, I had a little help from HP at that time. And Tony, uh, Tony George, man, he, uh, he was always behind me and, and gave me the opportunity to come back in, in 2006. And when you're you know, I had to go through rookie orientation again, which they called a refresher, but it was basically rookie orientation because I've been out of the car for so long. And, and I get to the garage area, and I think there were six of us that year or something like that. And uh, I walk out of the garage. I'm suited up. You know, you're, you're obviously a bit concerned what's going to happen and what, you know, if you, if you can or can't do it. And nobody's in the garage area. The car's right on pit lane. I go, this is perfect. Nobody's here. I get up to speed on my own, you know, my own time, my own frame, just get comfortable with it. Nobody's around. I walk out the, the, the pit lane. I look up towards the, the turn four. I'm looking where our car is, and I couldn't see it, so I turn towards turn one, and there's our car with about 50 reporters and cameras. And I go, holy <laughs> shit. Alone. Yeah, like, what, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah, like, I got, now, now I have that pressure, which was actually really good at hindsight because as soon as I got in the car, um, it was back to my office. I mean, it was like I didn't miss a beat, and, and you know, I plugged it in gear and took off, and, and I thought, now, how, how did I do this? I remember my first ever lap around the Speedway it was really slow because I was looking at the grandstands and the pagoda and, the, you know, just, just trying to take it in. And I thought, crap, I got a job to do here. I better, I better start going. So my second return, which was that, that first time back on track, I thought, you know what? I, I got the back straight away, and I just got, got after it, you know. And, like, third time by, I was already at, like, 220, and things were happening. I go, okay, I got it, you know. And so, uh, so being able – in that race um, – I was in the top five most of the day, and then rains came on. That's your Dario yep. one. It rained. Anything could have happened, but I think if we feel, if, if the race didn't get rained out, that I had a shot at the top five because that's kind of where we were. We just got out of strategy when the rain came at the wrong time for us. But I'll take a top nine, and, and I remember my comeback story was I just want to – I don't want to finish my career on a fence in Texas, right, in, in, in a crash. I just want to come back and do one more IndyCar race. Just I'll go back short track racing and – all that, but I want to. I want to come to one more Indy 500 or Indy car race, and then I'm. I'm. The, it's raining. We're coming down pit lane. I go. How did I tell everybody? I lied to everybody. This ain't done. I got to do some more of this. <laughs> you know, I was competitive. I had fun, <clears throat> and uh, it was awesome. And then come back and did you know retired race or Indy cars in 2011. As you know, I still SVRA and some super modified stuff with my pal Johnny and 
win a run. I, you know, there's a chance a little 500 this year, maybe do some Silver Crown races. So I'm still having fun, man. Just like KO, I'm not quite as old as he is, but I'm still having fun. Yeah, you're you're <laughs> you're still doing a lot of racing for sure. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you did continue to race up to 2011 and was part of that final race there in, in Las Vegas that took Dan Weldon's life. Yeah. Man, oh man, what a uh, well, that did. Fortunately, you were you were not involved in yeah. that wreck, but boy, what so, a massive wreck. So, so the, you know, the disasters in our sport, the people that we we love, and we're all family. And then when that happens, it's just we've all been there, right? It's just not a fun part, of, fun day, or fun part of the sport. But when that green flag came out, I don't know if you remember, they started what thirty five cars or something crazy. It was like the whole field was there, and and um, um, that track, it was not the track's fault by any stretch of the imagination. It was the combination of that style track to the rules that we had at that time with our cars, they were just too easy to drive. It was, they were too easy to drive. Like, for example, that time, I say I could put my mother in that car and said, trust me, and just go out and hold it wide open. Just hold it wide open and follow that line. And, and there were some rookies in the field. And there are plenty of them. And so it was just way too easy. And so, um, you know, I hadn't been there for years. Any of us had. And I pulled out of pit lane with uh, PT and Townsend. And we're going to try to work together and, and – I pull out of the pits and by turn three I'm wide open, never lifted. You know, what I mean it was it was just no challenge to it. And we were we're going fast. And the problem is we were pack racing back then. You know, you're two, three wide, you're seven, eight deep, and I mean you're just in that pack moving around. And when that green flag came out, the respect of the new drivers, I I'm gonna say at that time, they all wanted to get to the front in a hurry. And you gotta remember that happened on lap eight or whatever. Um and I just they're banging and touching and smoke going off tires and I seen Dario and Danica actually go to the bottom and start backing up. And I'm up high thinking I'm going to race. I thought, you know what? I think, I think I'm with them. You know, so I pulled the bottom at the right time because that lap is when, when all hell broke loose. And, I mean, it was hell. If I, if I, it was hell. If I, I could, remember it. If I could paint or make a, a script of a movie of what I've seen and cars flying over me and the flames and stuff going, it, you would think it's fake. I mean, it's like that could not happen. It was like a it was fake like Armageddon. movie. It was unbelievable. And um, so I made it through the accident. And unfortunately, it was not many of us that made it through. I think there was only like eight cars. or so. It was crazy. I mean, most of the field got tied up in that thing. And um, that was it. You know, when I, when I found out that, I said, you know what? Well, I, I raced different than that. I raced with respect. I, I, I raced offensively, offensively, not defensively. And um, um, I just didn't see that. I just I thought, you know what? It's not going to get better. And, and I'm getting older. And I have a lot of things going on, and, and that did it. You know, it was, it, was, it was time. It was time to hang it up at that point. So that's what happened. KO, you did climb in an Indy car. Talk to me about it. It looks like Roger's going to maybe try it. So if he does, maybe I, him and I will I'll go out and, you know, try to race against him in a match race or something, you know. So <laughs> Team drivers. That's my plan yeah. anyway. That's my plan. It's keep running the chili bowl and all that kind of stuff and the badger and all that. I'm kind of. I kind of found, figured out my level now at this age and everything, you know, that uh, uh, I, I know that it's going to be pretty hard to go anymore with the uh, uh, use of young kids anymore because it's just uh, uh, not my style, I guess, anymore. So we're going to kind of keep going. And actually this year at the Chili Bowl, I'm hoping to become the first fatality down there. Uh, <laughs> Oh my God. They've, they've never really had one, and at this point Cut. in my life, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're cutting that? Oh, I it's, just, it's just at this Mark. point in my life, I, you know, I, I've, lost, Marker. I've lost the will I've lost the will to live, and I just, you know, it would be great down there to maybe have my helmet come off flying into the crowd, that kind of thing, you know. So that's really my goal, but we'll see how it works out. So, so one thing with Ko, no, he's done. He's worked at every job from light bulb repairman to re relacing or re tipping shoelaces, right? But, <laughs> yeah. But one of the, yeah. One, one, one of the better ones was uh, was the uh, was it the uh, manure truck or something when you went through oh, town? Oh yeah. You... I got, oh yeah. I got hired <laughs> oh yeah. By, I got hired by Hans Lee, and he's a f farmer, you know. And up here, they they take the from the sewer. Uh, the, the fish making factory plant where they bring the sewage <laughs> then they haul it out to the farmers to the field and they spread it well so Hansi hired me to do it you know and, and uh it's a 5,000 gallon tanker truck and I didn't know anything about all that you know the servos and the switches and all that he gave me a quick rundown but we got to the Stoughton Wisconsin 
and, and it's under pressure. They pump it all up, and then you pull this valve, and that goes into a hole. Anyway, I pulled the valve, and, and it starts cranking all this waste out, you know, and I sat up in the truck, you know, sandwich or sleeping or something. A guy come running up to the truck, and he goes, it's blowing all over the road, you know, and, and I got out, and uh, I forgot to put the hole. So it's pumping this raw sewage out of this 5,000-gallon <laughs> tank, and it, it flooded the whole street. You know, and like the, the ditches were flooding and everything. I, I mean, I shut the thing off then, so it wasn't doing it anymore. But at that <laughs> point, it was it pretty off. bad. Good. I, I, I just kind of said, oops, you know, and just kind of took off, you know. And, and uh, I called Hansi. I said, hey, we've got a little problem there. And he just laughs, says, hey, next time, time. But uh, I don't know who had to clean that up, but it wasn't me. But uh, that was kind of one of the way most of my jobs went, you know. Uh, so, all right, Davey, I'm going to give you a minute to think about this. Yeah. I want you to think in the back of your mind here. We'll, we'll go over a couple more stories. But think of a good AJ story for me because I know you drove for him there for a little bit and uh, pretty colorful character to say the least. But in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, let's let's get people up to speed on your dad. Kenny yeah. Hamilton, longtime racer, um, Maybe raced against KO. At oh, some I am point, somewhere uh, back in the day. Sure. sure, yeah. But uh, historic race car with the pink lady, the number ninety-eight, and uh, ran Meridian. Did he own Meridian? For he a little he bit, had right? Meridian people for nineteen years. Or, yeah, Boise, Idaho. Yeah. Of course, a great, great race race facility over there. But pops made it to the five hundred, right? Yes. Yeah, so he um, he was fortunate, right? He was he had a construction job that, or business that actually worked out when I was young as well. But he was. Uh, he was known on the West Coast, man. He's a badass out there. Won loads of races in the Pink Lady, which was a 1967 built Grant King sprint car that's still out and about today. I mean, he, he read in that thing just a couple of years ago. I raced it like five, uh, six years ago, probably, and was super fast. I mean, I, I will tell you, 2016 at Meridian, if I'm not mistaken, uh, King of the Wing weekend, I think he qualified fifth. Yeah, and he was on the pole. He started on the pole in one of those races, right? I mean, so <laughs> in a 1967, I, I always at, come at the age of 74, I think. He yeah, was he's 80 now, so yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, uh, I always told Bobby, I go, Bob, I drove a 1967 Grant King, I felt a little naked, but it felt cool because your arms are out, like Kale says, you got this windshield and the injection sticking up. I thought, pretty, you can see the tires, and so you can drive the crap out of those things. And, and I thought, I'm driving this old car. I'm not going to be that competitive. Well, I was set a track record and went to the front, and, and I'm the one that put the fuel in the car. And by the way, I didn't put enough in because it had these old tanks underneath a fiberglass shell in the back, and I just didn't put enough fuel in it, and I ran out. I could have won the dang race that day. But I told Bob, when you gas the car, it went. When you turned it, it turned. I mean, it worked. I go, you need to copy that car because it was so good to drive. And he drove it all those years, right? Art Sue guy. Um, was the original owner of that hired my dad in the 60s when it was new and uh, Thompson Eva drove it a few times and it's it's been around a long time so iconic car I, and I will assure you that there's not a sprint car anywhere ever that's won more races than the pink lady it's been winning races since 1967 so an, another story but when you talk Irwindale he went to Irwindale Kern County this last few years and we had 30 some cars at the Irwindale race and and he was like 16th quick like right in the middle so I go up to him. I go, hey, everything good? He goes, yeah, car's good. I go, well, you're, you're 16th. You know, like, he goes, you see that car there? It's yours someday. He goes, so <laughs> if you want it to look like that, I'm 16th. If you want it to be crashed up, I maybe go a little quicker. And I go, no, it's good. It's good. You know, I'll just keep it right there. <laughs> but the craziest thing, since I was a kid, um, I'd walk in that shop as a little kid and see a pink lady in the shop. From then, last year, another fan of of my dad's when he was a kid watching him race the pink lady all those years um be, became successful and had some money and he went and offered my dad some good money for that car and it was too good to really turn down but he says ah, it's Dave. you know i promised davy the car so he calls me up and he tells me you know hey you know it's yours but i did get an offer for it and i go how much and he told me i go sell quick right <laughs> give me half yeah <laughs> So the crazy thing, I have not been to Idaho to walk in the shop, and there's not a pink lady there anymore. The good news, what the deal he made with him, though, is is you you can buy the car. It's yours. It stays at your shop, and he has GT40s and some cool hot rods, this guy. And uh, he goes, the deal is, if I want to race that car, if I ever want to take it back out, I want to be able to do it. He goes, it's yours to race whenever you want. So it's pretty cool. But the, but the pink lady is out of our, out of our family. Wow. Pretty pretty wild. So it's a shame. I can't believe that. I mean, happy for your dad, but I can't believe the Pink Lady is no longer part of the Hamilton family. 
However, it does sound like he can go have some fun with it. If he, he, if he, he can definitely go so. have fun with it. I, def- I made a deal that tell the guy that I get first ride if he ever wants to get rid of it or you know it gets left to his family. Who knows what whatever happens, but. I'm definitely not going to pay what he bought f- bought it for, <laughs> but I'm, I I would like to have that car if it comes down to it. Yeah. All right, Ko, uh, we're getting close to the end of this show here. Uh, what uh, what anniversary of the farewell tour will 2020 be? Eighth anniversary of the farewell uh, tour. It's either the eighth or the ninth. You know uh, that uh, that started out years ago when. I was, uh, I didn't have any t-shirts and then we were at the chili bowl. So I just went down to Walmart and bought the cheapest, uh, uh, t-shirts you could buy. You know, when you bought them then for eight, eight for a dollar or something, they're right from China full of uh, that, uh, disease they got or whatever to now. And anyway, I, I dipped them in asbestos and, and lined them with some lead and, and sold them just, uh, just the KO, uh, on it and, you know, I sold, I, I sold out of them right away. So at that point, I decided that the T-shirt business was a good thing. And we, uh, unfortunately, uh, my retirement interfered each year. But now this year, if I just, it looks like it'll be the ninth annual, yes. All right, you've had some time to think. AJ, well, so, AJ story. So the, the great thing, I'm so fortunate to have AJ Foyt stories, right? I mean, my, growing up, him being my hero, there's a lot of them I just can't tell. <laughs> just because I would get Shocker. trouble, and yeah, but but one of them was uh, as I was living in Vegas when I was driving for him, and he, and he calls me up and he goes, "Hey, uh, uh, what are you doing?" I go, "I'm not just hanging out." He goes, "Can you can you come to Texas?" I go, "Yeah, when?" He goes, "I think probably right now." I go, "Oh, okay." <laughs> like, so I get a plane ticket, I go to Texas. I'm the whole way. You're going? Is this it? Are we like? Is this a are you good? Fired? Yeah, am I getting out? What, what's going on? And we did just run second in the championship for him, and we we're kind of on a little bit of a roll and. And uh, and I got second to Stewart, but he cheated. So I don't know if that's a true second or what, but I know he cheated for sure. Well, we'll get Tony in here and we'll hear his side of the story. That should be a great show. Yeah. Future yeah. skinny show coming to you, Tony yeah. Stewart and Davey Hamilton. Yeah. Sort it's, out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go like this. Hey, Davey, or uh, Tony, Davey's talking about you yeah. on the show the other day. <laughs> Boom, he'll be right yeah. here. So, uh, so I... I get to the airport and usually he has somebody pick you up, but AJ picked me up himself. I go, well, I don't know if this is good or not either. So I get in the car and the first thing he goes, you weld, right? I go like weld, like metal. Yeah. I go, yeah. And well, he goes, good. He says, I uh, got some work to do in my bulldozer. <laughs> I go, oh, you know, I, I didn't dress for bulldozer work. And, and I thought, okay. So we, we got to his ranch and he has this inch thick steel plate, four by eight, big thing sitting on two drums. And uh, he goes, uh, I'll cut this out, and then you can weld it on the blade of my bulldozer. I go, okay, like, all right. And I go, these drums, are they, like, you, they, you need to move them out a little bit? And he goes, yeah, let's move them out just a little bit so it's just on the edge of them. I go to move one, it's full of methanol. Both of them are full of methanol. <laughs> and I go, AJ, these are full of methanol. He goes, I'll be all right, no big deal. So I see, I see he fires this torch up with a flame blowing like two feet long, and he's cutting this inch thick steel. And, and I, I turn, cause I'm getting away. So I'm walking, I turn around and he's doing this with no, no goggles, goggles nothing. nothing on old school. And I go, Oh, AJ, I go, don't do you have some goggles? Ah, I couldn't find them. So I had some brand new fat heads, <laughs> right? He put, I give them to him, I wear them. He puts, puts the sunglasses on and I turn around to get out of there again. And the thing run, runs out of oxygen. Well, they run out of oxygen. It makes this pop. So I hear this pop, big bang. I turn around and the glasses are smoking. Right. I mean, there's like all the metal and stuff. And he goes, whoa, good thing he gave me those. Right. Like, yeah. He never did. He never did replace them, by the way. Right? <laughs> that was just it. So so he's a bit of the crazy guy, too, on that. So it was, it, it was a lot. And I so then I, I we finally get it done. We're out there working hard in this field. And he's a worker. Let me tell you, he is not afraid to work. So I weld him on there and I'm going, I, I'm used to welding chromoly tubing on a race car not inch thick skill still on a blade of a bulldozer. And so we get them all well done and he goes, okay, I'll try it out. And he takes off and all he sees these big 50 foot tall, 60 foot, 70 foot tall trees, just like he's dropping, just them. dropping them. I go, God, I hope my welds hold up. Well, they did, which was a good thing. And, but, uh, but we, we had, that was a fun day. Just him and I hanging out for the whole few days. Actually, we had, we had a good time. 
yeah. fly in here. I need I need somebody to weld this up because well, there's no other welders in no, Texas. No, I come from Vegas then to do it. <laughs> but we, we, you know, uh, it, it, one thing with AJ is is uh, we all know that he's a character. We all know the passion that he has. And and by the way, I want to say happy birthday to Mario and Aldo Andretti today. It's their birthday oh, today. Yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. So. Um, Another heroes, right? And guys, great for the sport. But AJ has such a passion for the sport that um, he and just him wants and to AJ win. are buddies, right? They're best friends right now, right? And just why I read it, <laughs> BFF, right? <laughs> and uh, and so uh, um, just knowing that he wants to to, to win, and he has that. He, he would drive anything at any time. Um, that you take after that. That's I was so fortunate to be able to drive for him and, and have him be a hero, then be a good friend. And and I I'm proud to say, still we're great friends. We had a little rocky time. Um, what you do with AJ, but today we're we're best of friends, so that's cool. Yeah. You know, you just brought up Mario, and this is a, a this is a great story. I'm going to ask you to tell it here because you still currently drive the two seater. Yeah, Mario drives the two seater, and then they brought in Elio Castroneves to to drive the two seater a little bit. I think it was last year, and the three of you guys were out giving laps, and he was he was watching the times on the board. So so Mario. We are to give rides in the two-seater and cars that are made to give rides. They're not racing cars. But Mario is a racing driver that he doesn't care when you put a helmet on. That means you're racing. And so I will guarantee you at his age, at 80, is he 85 today or 80? It's in there, right? I don't know, I don't know exactly what, how old he is today. But he's a young whatever age he is. And, yeah. and, and I, would, if I, I would love to put him in a current race car today and give him like a half a day. Because he's a badass. He could still get the job done. Now, he did that once and did a triple flip over here at the Speedway. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say because you know, that and, got a little wild. And so uh, just uh, not very long ago, we had a, we had a long talk about that, that incident. And he told us the whole story and what he felt and seen. And thank God he didn't even really get hurt. I think he cut his chin or something, he told me. But uh, being able to hang out with A.J. and Mario still today is, you know, it's a highlight for me, obviously. Yeah. yeah, 80 years old. Eight, he's 80, so he's my dad's age, actually. And they, my dad's still racing as well, so they, there's something with those guys that they still want to get it done. K- and, and KO's they, got a chance. Yeah, you it, yeah said, KO, you're young. You said you were running around, and he looked up on the board, and he wanted to have a quicker time, and you would – did you hide a set of tires? Yeah, so what happened there, well, that was a long time ago at Kentucky, and age, or at Mario, he would look up at his time, you know, and how fast I go, oh, what's he looking at? What does he keep? But I seen that we, at that time, we had transponders on the two-seaters. Now, we got to remember, this is Kansas City. I think it was either Kansas or Kentucky. It's been a long time since we raced there. And I thought, oh, he's, he's looking at the time to make sure he's the fastest up there, right? <laughs> so so I, there, I only had a few rides left, and I, and I thought, well, I wonder if I could beat that, right? So I told Joe Kennedy that owns the two-seaters, I go, you know, I think, my tires are, man, they're vibrating. I can hardly see. So he pulls a new set on, and I go out there and just pin it flat out, and I go right to the top, and Mario goes, what the heck? How did you get, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he is so competitive. And, and let me tell you, if he could race today, people have a hard time beating that guy. He, he, he still has what it takes. He still has that feel, and it's, it's awesome to, 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 to drive the two-seater with him. So, really is. so the 500 this year, they had the big deal with Cummins, right? Cummins engine power. Tony, of course, uh, you know, Stewart's affiliated with them, you know, uh, Columbus boy, Columbus, Indiana company, you know, all that. So they asked Tony to come down and run at this, you know, come down and do the lap, right? So it's Tony, Lynn St. James, um, pro- I think it was Rutherford, and Big Al was there, and um, and a couple of others, anyhow. So Tony was supposed to drive. I can't remember what he was supposed to drive, uh, which one it was, but he got moved because somebody couldn't push the clutch in or something on this one car, so he drives that, right? Anyhow, now keep in mind, I have sent a police officer to the airport to pick him up, okay, because he's flying in from wherever he was racing the night before, to pick him up. And then the police officer is going to deliver him to me and turn to on the golf cart. I'm going to run him in. They're calling nonstop. I'm driving across the golf course at about Mach 80, trying to get him over to the grid. I see the old diesel Cummins motor starting up because there's a huge cloud of you know diesel smoke coming out. And he's, and he's on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right here, right here, right. So, of course... As we say at Tony time, you know, standard Tony time. But anyhow, we get him over there. 
he does the lap, right? You're talking about, you know, Mario, how competitive he is. So we get done. They got these cool old school, you know, shirts that Cummins gave them. We go back over to our suite and turn two, right? We park the golf cart. We're getting ready to walk up. As we're walking up there, Big Al's right there. And I don't know where he was going, but he was right there getting ready to get on the elevator, you know? And we were getting ready to walk up the stairs. He said, boy, have you lost your mind? And he goes, what are you talking about? He goes, you trying to pass me on this track? <laughs> like Tony was in that old car trying to pass the old man. And Big Al wasn't having yeah, it. Yeah. He wasn't they having it at passion, all. Man. These guys, I love those guys, man. I love those guys. <laughs> they're battling man. right yeah. to the very end. It's just yeah. the way they're wired, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, KO, one, one other quick little thing. So I know Chili Bowl is a big deal for KO. And, and no, he's going to finish the race this year. Let's just say that. But we have some big, exciting things for KO, and 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 we have some other things to announce soon. I'll do it. I'll do it with you guys. Perfect. But Chili Bowl's a long ways away, but we're going to do some fun stuff at Chili Bowl next year. By the way, congratulations, KO. You finished tenth in your B main on your prelim night Friday night. I mean, it's a solid effort. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. That was the same race that the guy flipped and landed on top of this, and kind of. Uh, Kind of screwed us up a little bit, but uh, then we went back for Saturday, and the throttle was stuck wide open, so uh, we didn't get to go any further. But uh, this year, we're hoping to uh, come back, and uh, probably a pretty good chance we'll win it. <laughs> this, hey, hey, this is this is went from getting buried yeah, after you leave that, there that, to the winning. Win, it. Yeah, that's right. No, we got some good things happening. We're moving forward with okay, this. Well, I like it. One thing, how how. Do they determine when you have a concussion? <laughs> uh, I just go by the black eyes, you know. If, 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 <laughs> you know, it's the different levels. Like, you know, if if you're just kind of, you know, feeling a little woozy or whatever, that's nothing really. But if you got a good set of black eyes, both of them now, not just one, then you got a concussion. And a real good concussion is when your eyes turn red on the inside and a little bit of yellow, you know, and it scares people. <laughs> That that's a good one. I had that when I broke my, I, I broke my neck and and uh, C one and two and I broke all my. It was a pretty good hit. And the, and the, these this friend of mine brought his kids in. They were like seven eight years old. And when they saw me, they started crying and would run out of the room. I thought well, I must have a pretty good one now, you know. You also think one of the benefits of wearing an open face helmet is the fact that if it if it needs to fly off, it can. Yeah, I mean, that was always kind of the day, you know, when they, the helmets a lot of times come off the guy's head, you know, because they were uh, just didn't have the engineering to do now. And, you know, and, and every time it come off, almost everybody would think your head was still in it, you know, and I always thought that was kind of a <laughs> cool attraction for the kids, especially, you know, for all the kids out there, you know, to, they, they remember rolling that down stuff. the straightaway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they don't, they don't remember who finished second or third or whatever, but boy, 50 years later, they'll talk about when that guy's head, he thought the guy's head come off. I would like my helmet flip, went down the track. They'll remember that forever. So that's really what you're looking for is building memories for these guys. And uh, so I, Great I'm a memories. big proponent of this open face. Yeah, well, <laughs> but, uh, you know, usually most of the time the head isn't in it. So it's, it's just, you know... <laughs> So, Davey, give us your three best non-racing stories. Oh, geez, that's tough. It's three, right? three, three great things. That... So, non-racing's tough because that's my life. I grew up with it. When I was two years old, my dad started racing. And so, you know, I, I didn't go to my graduation. I didn't go to the proms. I, I went racing. So, I those did. are great stories. Yes. I like that. You know, so I, I, didn't, I didn't hit anything like that. All my buddies are at the lake, you know, skiing, snow skiing, or up the hill, or they're on the lake water skiing and doing all this stuff. I'm at the racetrack, so I, I didn't get involved. I'd hang out with them during the week. So, you know, majority of my stories really are, are racing, honestly. And so, um, and, and the highlights that, that, that hit is, is, you know, I was able to um, race at Indy 11 times, which is pretty awesome. I was able to run, be in the championship or a contender in IndyCar racing, which was definitely Got beat a goal. by a cheater. Yeah, I got beat by a cheater, but uh, but wasn't his fault. He was just driving. <laughs> and then but you know all the success i've had you know won 18 super modified championships i had had 21 track records at one time you know running for Trigero brothers and guys like john lawson Kansani, bobby east you know some of these guys just um just it's just an honor to be able to have that opportunity things have changed obviously we get older and don't know how and why it happened but here we are and and now um i'm having fun trying to give other you know uh, uh robert stout ken's son Ran a couple years with us in sprint cars, man, and 
he's a badass. He he was he could win a wing sprint car race, which is not easy to do. And no. so it's fun. Uh, James Davison, I put him in a Silver Crown car, and I don't know if you'd seen that race, but he he did great in a Silver Crown car. He didn't even know how to sit upright in in a car and how to run the pedals. So he you know, when he came out to my shop to sit in it. It was like, how do these pedals even work? You know, I mean, that's how green he was to a sprint, <laughs> or a sprinter several crown car. And he, I think he got ninth at Salem, and then he went to Raceway Park, started ninth, and drove his way to fourth. You know, I mean, he was with the, the, the hitter. So, and was uh, jacked. I mean, mean, he was yeah, excited. He did yeah. great. And so uh, David Bird was a big part of that program. We're going to run several crown cars again with David. I have four pavement cars and a dirt uh, silver crown car plus some pavement sprint cars. So I have fun doing that right now. I'm going to drive some myself, but – Giving young guys opportunities, giving just opportunities to guys that want to want to go race, and you know, USAC is coming up with that 400 lapper at Raceway Park, or not USAC. I shouldn't say that; it's really Raceway Park. Yeah, yeah. I call it Raceway Park, but Lucas Oil Raceway. Um, so a 400 lap Silver Crown race. It's I'm not sure it's a hundred thousand to win. I like the winnings. I don't know what second pays, but hopefully you can win that darn thing for hundred grand. Fifty so. bucks for yeah, second. yeah. That's that's the problem, right? Because it's going to be expensive. I mean, there's a lot of wear, wear and tear on your cars and stuff like that. But uh, just some new creative things coming up. I, I'm proud to say that I still own the King of the Wing Sprint Car Series, which is the Wing Pavement Series that we're all over the country. I have a great schedule out this year, and just you know, I'm a race guy. It's uh, it's an amazing the King of the Wing. Speaking of, I mean. Watching them run at Anderson, watching them run at Salem, Winchester. I mean, it's like watching slot cars. Yeah. And, I mean, it is amazing how how fast and how they get it done. I, you know, Lucas Oil Raceway is cool as well, you know. Yeah. But but those tracks, the high banks, I mean, it's like flat out. So. I've never been so scared in my life. Winchester scared me. Kern County. Kern County. Wow. Kern County scared me to death watching my son inside of that wing sprint car. And, and you can hear the motors. I mean... Yeah, they got in the car, and if the car was right, and in this case it was, I remember qualifying flat foot, out. foot flat on the floorboard and went around there. If you recall, uh, he had a flat tire. I think yeah, it was a right rear right. Went, went down on him in, in qualifying. And, uh, and I, 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 mean, it, I mean, it just sends chills through you because, right. I mean, they're flat out. And uh, who was the guy that, that lost a, was a right front right hub? Right front, uh, L- uh, Richie Larson. Larson, your yeah, right front hub. Hard, Coming out of turn two at Kern, this is a half mile. Hundred. So I, I when I first went there and tested in Gerhardt's car because I wanted to test myself and it was same thing wide wide open and they had me at 165 mile an hour in the straightaways in a yeah. wing sprint car. So, I, mean, I mean it's I mean, like a getting... super speedway, but it's a half mile. I mean it's so big wide. half mile. You right. run the you run the bottom maybe maybe lane three or so yeah. something because the, yeah. the wing cars have enough downforce to run the bottom right. and still carry that momentum. But yeah, I mean it just made it a violent right hand turn and he smoked the wall. It's like. I mean, this stuff is no joke. No joke. Yeah. And him and Jason Kahn got together. Jason Kahn rolled up on him and thought he was clear, and right rear hits the left front and sparks, and he slid up over the nose. This is at 165 in the race. You're saying 150, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And nobody flipped and nobody crashed. I'm like, I don't know what just happened there, but that doesn't ever need to happen again. I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was, it's, yeah. it's sketchy. I mean, the cars make 900 horsepower. Yeah. And, and, and they weigh in at 1,700 pounds or yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, 1,680 or whatever it is now, yeah. So, so and, and, and you know, the, the whole concept of King of the Wing was to try to have a national pavement wing sprint car series. Nobody, Everybody was doing regional stuff, but we never really were able to race against each other. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough getting races, but I try to do three per weekend in each region. And so we just released our California schedule, our Northwest, Colorado, and we we're just about to finish the Midwest schedule. And next year we're going into Florida for speed week. So we'll have five weekends. The goal is to have three races per weekend at three different tracks is the goal. So, uh, yeah, just makes it where, easy. Where can you see it? I know you had some stuff with Mav at one point. Is there? Yeah. Certain... So we're working on that right now. Actually. I, I talked to uh, Shaheen actually this morning and we have a, we have a call next week and, and, uh, there's some Roku TV. You yeah, can watch some yeah, of it there. Roku, yeah, yeah, Roku TV, and and so that's what about know. flow and that stuff? Like what the USAC and them stuff? Yeah, it seems so like they're catching on pretty. They good. are, and so one thing you gotta remember: I'm a racing driver. That's what I know, right? Yeah. I mean, when it comes to all that side, I'm pretty, I'm pretty weak to be just straight honest with you. I love working with my sponsors and taking care of them, and and the race side I love. But when it comes to the TV and the media and the social media stuff, I'm I need help with that. And so we're, we're working hard to get it to the next level with King of the Wing and keep it alive. And, you know, we, uh, we averaged, I think, se- uh, let me see, uh, 17 cars last year. So it was a little low because the first year we started, we, we averaged 28. Um, we're going to get back there this year. We got a lot of guys coming back, some guys in Colorado buying new cars. Up the Northwest, some guys buying cars. So 
Uh, now does Bob build those? Who's yeah, building yeah. those cars? So so uh, Bob East builds the majority of them. Uh, there's a hurricane out of Florida. Obviously the the Diablos that Dave still built. Yeah. There's a big you know a lot of guys have Diablos, which I had myself along with. I have a Beast and a Diablo, um, and you can still get them. Johnny Gilbertson kind of took over that program down there, and and he's on his own now. Um, he's not with Dave Steele Performance, but he's on his own trying to keep the Diablo alive. And um, and so yeah, they're they're out there. You can buy them. Yeah. The racing is incredible. The cars, like you said, I mean, they they almost look fake. They're going yeah. so fast. It's it's incredible stuff. So exciting for sure. <laughs> How about you, Ko? You got three good ones, non racing. Uh, oh, non racing. Um, well, I guess uh, I got one when we were at a. Uh, you were talking about Mario earlier when we were at he when they honored him in Long Beach for the. Uh, uh, you know, when they do that road race drivers, big dinner there and, and when everybody goes to it, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but anyway, my friend, uh, Jeff Haywood and I attended it and Mario, they were, he was the guest of honor and I walked up to him, you know, to, with my can my phone and asked him if it'd be all right, if we could get a picture. And, uh, you know, he said, sure, you know, actually I did it with Penske too. And, um, uh, I just handed him my phone, you know. He, I just kind of pushed my So they could take the them. picture. Yeah, take the picture of me. I take the picture of me and hey, would I give it to you? Not Mara, with him, but would you, would you mind if we got a picture? And he, well, it was uh. better with Roger because Roger had all of his guys around him. I said, Roger, would you mind if we got a picture? And he goes, he got up, you know, and all of his yes men were sitting there looking at me like, who's this clown? You know, then I started, you know, handing Roger the phone, the camera phone, and everyone, he kind of looked at it kind of funny, and then all of a sudden he figured it out, and he took our picture. But Mario, he kind of looked at it. Mario wasn't really happy about it at first, you know, and then finally he did it, you know. But then, but then the best part is I had my buddy Nick Gomer take a picture of Mario taking a picture taking of Taking a picture of so, you guys. Yeah. So. so 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 another time with KO, uh, this is a non-racing that he, he, he I, I thought was pretty funny, but he sent me a picture. And it shows him laying in front of the Betty Ford clinic with beer cans all around my <laughs> in front of the was it the Betty Ford? Is that where it was? Yeah, Betty Ford down. At, yeah, I think that was in Phoenix. But uh, that was no <laughs> joke. I just couldn't get inside. You know, it was as far as I could. <laughs> so, but, uh, no, I, I they guess, threw uh, threw you out with your beer cans. <laughs> when I what one year at the Chili Bowl. I drove Jack Hewitt's two seater and he had some woman there that had a lot of money and she paid like three grand for the ride, but she was really kind of obnoxious, you know? So, uh, Hewitt says to me, he says to me when I was going to drive the car, he says, give this, you know, give this woman a good ride. She's pretty obnoxious, you know? So I took some beer cans and when they pushed us out on the front straightaway to start it, I kind of threw the beer cans out on the track, you know, like I was drinking. <laughs> and then drinking in the, you know, and it kind of looked good, pretty good for the crowd too, to see me throw them out there and everything. So anyway, I, I got going and I bicycled the car and kind of ended up in the fence. And, you know, I bicycled and came back down and we hit the fence and the woman was in the back, beat me on the back saying, let me out, let me out. You know, I said, no, we're going again, you know. Yeah. But, we're uh, getting ready to push off again. We're not letting you yeah. out. <laughs> but, uh, I guess the other thing I was going to say that was non-racing is when uh, I went to a, uh, when I first got out of high school, I went and had a physical exam and uh, I had the highest sperm count uh, for the day there. I always thought that was, you know, when they did the count, I always thought that was one of my highlights of my life. And uh, I hope to God they I, gave you a plaque for that. I, uh, I was married quite a few times and Every time I ever got married, they were pregnant, you know, so I figured it must have been some kind of a, some kind of a truth to it. So, but, uh, they all ended up. Excuse me animals. while I whip this out. <laughs> <laughs> I think my favorite story though, and then I, and that, cause I, I too long winded here, but, uh, it was when, uh, I actually went to Muhammad Ali's house. That was, that was really probably the, one of the biggest highlights of my whole life, you know, back, uh, Back in the 90s, I guess it was, he was always such a hero of mine. And uh, we ran Kokomo one night. And uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, I had my son with me and, and I had an old Ranchero, uh, Ford Ranchero. And we, I decided we were going to go meet him because that was one of my big goals in my life. And we drove up to his house. And uh, 
I got to the front gate and I started pushing all the buttons there and somebody come on and I told him, you know, I had my son with me. Ali was a big fan of mine, you know, and the next thing I know, the gates <laughs> opened. Oh, this all, this really is a true story, you know, and uh, <laughs> so we go pull him down. He's got this long circular driveway. We get down towards the end of the driveway and this rancher I got is like a 79. It had like 300,000 or something. And just as I was going to draw the driveway, I lost lost the brakes where the uh, <laughs> back facility went out of the actually. And I could have brakes, but it was one of them deals like, you know, while you're pushing the brake, all the fluid squeezing out, you know. And uh, so I'm in the car. I got my son in there. He's like six or seven, something like that. We get to the end of the driveway, and I thought, I ain't going to be able to stop in time, and I'm going to run, end up in his front yard or hit his house or something they're gonna think i'm some you know they didn't have terrorists back then but they probably would have thought that's what it was nowadays you know and luckily i got her slowed down but i did end up on his yard and uh, any, anyway we end up going in and and uh, uh his wife lonnie let us in and i told her the whole story and pretty soon she says go on in the living room muhammad's in there and i walk into the living room and we're just standard there's nobody there you know, and then uh, we're just, uh, you know, I'm kind of scared to death because I don't know what to think. You know, I'm the only white guy on the place. and You know, I shouldn't even probably be in there. <laughs> and Next thing I know, he appears like out of nowhere, you know, and he's got this robe on. He looks like he's 10 feet tall and he's just glaring at me. It's about 11 o'clock in the morning. He's just glaring at me like, what are you doing in my living room? You know, he's just staring at me, you know, with a frown, you know, and he starts walking towards me. And I, I'm thinking to myself, wow, what, what, what have I done here? You know, and then he gets right close to us and all of a sudden he just kind of goes ah, like that and jumps at us, you know, and starts laughing. And I mean, that was such a thrill. The whole, I spent That's the whole day picture. with him and went back, uh, went back to his house oh, four or five times. It was really, really quite a thrill just to be able to say you spent the day with him, you know. He uh, he had a lot of charisma and could, oh could pretty well get away with saying saying about anything. Well, that's and, like that's like AJ Howard or, Cosell, remember? Yeah, Howard oh, Cosell man, was awesome. You know, I met I met Evil Knievel. That was a highlight as well. Meeting, I spent a day with Evil Knievel, and and uh, that was he's something else too, right? I mean, yeah. th those were the guys that they you didn't have to worry about what's in their mind because they told you right, good, better, and different. And so it's cool knowing a lot of guys like that. And our sport, right, being in this sport allows us to meet you know cool people like Muhammad Ali or. Well, we'll wrap things up here. K.O., man, we really appreciate you taking the time to come in here. And you said, you know, it's all about making memories for those kids. Of course, you were talking about heads rolling down the straightaway. But we want to thank you for coming in here and helping make some memories for people watching the skinny. <laughs> well, I, it was my honor. I mean, uh, anytime I can uh, tell our stories and, you know, it, it, with my Alzheimer's and everything, it kind of helps me remember, too, you know. And, uh, you know, of course, Davey and I uh, – we, we got a lot of them stories we can't tell, maybe, but uh, it, it's really an honor to be on it. And uh, this skinny is uh, quite the deal, man. I like it. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Davey, thanks for taking time. I know yeah. you're really busy, super busy dude, and no worries, a lot of stuff coming up here. And I uh, uh, wish you the best of luck, obviously, with the King of the Wings series, with the IndyCar series, with the IndyCar team. Uh, I know you, with your with your Silver Crown team, I mean, you've got a lot yeah, of it, irons in the fire, man. Probably too many, but I love it. It's what I do, right? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. wish you'd hurry up and come up with an idea for my property so we can make it. <laughs> yeah, well, we're working on that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Some good stuff. Rico, thanks again, as always, for letting us always. use this fabulous studio. And Carl and Aaron, back behind the scenes, you don't see them, but they're the ones making us, well, trying to make us look good. The pictures are pretty anyways, and the reason you can hear us is because those guys are monitoring everything. So thanks a lot. Hope everybody enjoyed it. We'll, uh, we'll hit you again here on The Skinny with more superstars in the future. Thanks for watching this episode of The Skinny. Be sure to check out all the latest sun and optical eyewear at fatheads.com. Special thanks to our sponsorship partners at Elliott's Custom Trailers and Carts. been a production of Fathead Studios. Please remember to subscribe. <laughs>